Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Double AS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff. This is part of the great stuff. This is the Double AS Journal author series. And I am super happy to have Yasu Odoi with us today. Hello. Hello, hello Yasu Odoi. Hi. Uh, well, thank you very much for agreeing to talk about your very lovely article, which will. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah. Uh, and Yasu, where are you located at? What's your geolocation? Um, yeah, I'm at Tokyo in Japan. Tokyo. Is there, does it snow in Japan? Does it snow in Tokyo? Actually, actually, today it is heavily raining. Oh, okay. Uh, and it is morning. Uh, it's Thursday morning, uh, February yeah, yeah. You And it's Wednesday evening, February 21, uh, as we record this. So yeah, a little bit of rain here. Good. Um, no rain in Phoenix. So I'm living in Phoenix and we haven't gotten any rain and we don't have any snow. <laughs> We're just heating, okay, heating up in the desert here. So very cool. Ah, uh, and Yasu, oh, what do you like to do for research? Yeah, my, actually for the research, my main interest is the, uh, about star formation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'd like to understand the full story of the star forming process. But the, uh, actually one characteristic, very important characteristic of the star formation is that uh, it's well, spatial scale is covering very wide range, yeah. from starting from the, the full galactic range more than one kiloparsec or ten kiloparsec, but they're, they're going down to less than the individual well, say, point one per sec or hey, yeah. even even much smaller scales. Cool. And the yeah yeah point is that the uh, well recently more and more researchers are going to study much more smaller scales using, for example, AOMA or JWST or such kind of big possibilities. Yeah. Uh -huh. But the uh, yeah my main interest is the uh, leave those things up to others. And I, I'm I'm interested in covering a little bit or relatively wider scales. Right. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Nice. And that is going to bring us to this very awesome APJ article. It is open access. It's the open access era. People go get a copy for free. Tomographic imaging of the Sagittarius spiral arms magnetic field structure and Yasuo, take us away. Thank you very much. So in this well, paper, we are going to present the our uh, uh, activity uh, covering the uh, three-dimensional uh, magnetic field structure, especially in the galactic spiral arm structure. Yes. And yeah, and uh, this is a uh, we believe this is a very fast well trial to rebuild the uh, actual three-dimensional structure of the magnetic field uh, from the field mm -hmm. uh, using the spiral arm, the galactic spiral. Okay. So, well, let me start and the uh, first for the introduction. I, if, so you might know that the, the magnetic field is quite uh, playing a vital role, especially right. for well, shaping the interstellar medium, mm -hmm. because the point is that the magnetic field, a uh, pressure and also magnetic field tension are both non-uniform force compared to the uniform force of uh, such like the uh, gravitational force or uh, yeah. thermal pressure. So naturally the, the magnetic field force, they tend to shape the interstellar medium. And finally, well, uh, it's finally form the stars facing them. Mm -hmm. So the for star formation process, the magnetic field must play a vital role. So, so yeah. we'd, we'd like to uh, review, especially the spatial structure of the magnetic field mm -hmm. and understand how, how it affects the star formation process or how the swap formation uh, goes. Okay. Because right. the, the swap formation history must be uh, well imprinted in the structure of the magnetic field itself. Yes. So that is our main interest. Main interest. And the, uh, what was written? So, yeah. So, uh, how we can observe magnetic field is so normally we use the polarization, parametric observation. Mm -hmm. uh, from the astronomical dust particles, interstellar dust particles. Mm -hmm. And the dust particles are thought to be oblique and mm -hmm. they are thought to be aligned as their minor axis are parallel a, to the magnetic field. Uh -huh. so yes. The major axis is perpendicular to them. Yep. And if we observe the thermal radiation of the dust particles mm -hmm. or a, a selective absorption light, Yes. The stellar light behind the dust particles, they will, give, they will give us the information about the, the direction, orientation of the magnetic field. Good. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah, that's that's mm -hmm. the basic technique. But the uh, yes. there are two points. There are two points. Technical two points, and one is that the uh, they were going to tell us only the projected uh, structure of the magnetic field onto the plane of the sky. Yes. So we only know the two dimensional distribution. Yeah. And uh, the other one is that the uh, because the uh, polarization is the uh, cumulative quantity. So they they only tell us the integrated information yes. for the magnetic field structure along the line, line of sight. And if you observe the thermal emission of the dust particles in the sub-millimeter wavelengths, mm -hmm. like Planck satellite, uh, essentially they tell us the, the whole integration of the polarization uh, information along the line of sight. Yes. The, uh, if we observe the, the optical polarimetry emission from the starlight, background starlight, that will give us the information. It is also the integrated information that uh, integrated information, but the, uh, it is the integration up to the distance of the star, Yes, a particular star. Mm -hmm. so, so that's the difference between submeter and optical parameter observation. Okay. And so, okay. and if we observe a, a number of stars, and if we, if the stars have different distances from us, then they will give us a different range of distance integration, yeah. integrated information of the polarization. So, so nowadays we have Gaia, Gaia data, Thank and they will, yeah. So <laughs> thanks to Gaia, we know the accurate distance to the individual stars. Yes. And if we observe many stars, and the, if we differentiate the yeah, information. Okay. Okay. Sure. Yeah, then, then we'll know the uh, distance dependence, then depends, uh, different dependence mm -hmm. of the magnetic structure as a function of distance. Yes. So in such manner, we, we can deduce the uh, three-dimensional, I would say, the magnetic structure as a function of distance. I'm with you. Yes, makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So, and then, uh, so you know, actually, actually, this is a quite simple idea, so it is not all new. And several authors have been tried this technique, including ourselves. Yes. In, yeah. That the uh, the uh, the novelty of this article is here uh, applying this technique to the galactic plane, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they uh, to distinguish or identify multiple magnetic field layers of a uh, superposed on the along the line of sight, and not only one or two, but I would say many. And also, also, it is the very first time to apply this technique to the galaxy uh, spiral arm structure yes. and reveal the uh, arm structure, the, uh, uh, the magnetic field structure within the spiral arm. That is, that is almost not known today. OK, OK. Uh, because we have difficulty to, especially the off-plane, off-plane offset from yes. the galaxy plane uh -huh. is, is almost not known. Okay. So the in-plane distribution can be observed, for example, to observe the uh, extra galaxies based on galaxies. Mm -hmm. and then we can measure the uh, magnetic field orientation. But the uh, if we would like to observe the off-plane offset distribution yes. of the magnetic field from, from the galaxy plane, and so we need to observe the uh, galaxies on the edge on orientation. Yes. And then. Yeah, the, all, all the information along the line set will be piled up. Mm -hmm. So we we'll only know the average orientation of the magnetic field. Yes. And that, that is accessory parallel to the jack plane. So today, so I'll say all the models and all the observation are basically indicating the jack plane. Large scale magnetic fields is running just along the jack plane. Okay. Parallel to the jack plane. Okay. Uh, but but a uh, so we 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 not uh, we don't know the reality within the we uh, don't. Uh, plane structure. So true. Uh, we we try to uh, reveal that structure mm -hmm. applying this the uh, tomographic technique of the uh, optical parametry. Love it. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Okay. So that's a basic idea, and and we we targeted the Sagittarius spy arm. That is one of the major arm. Of yeah. the galaxy spiral structure. Yes. And observed here. Yeah. Uh, galactic in long shot about 14 degrees. Yes. Uh, 1450 there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, including here. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, that's where we're at. And you get linear polarimetry from Kuzin's uh -huh. art. Yeah, so the observations we actually, so we, we do the optical parametry. And uh, what we use the, uh, is the uh, Kanata telescope. That is a telescope at Hiroshima, Japan. Mm -hmm. And it is a relatively small telescope, 1.5 meter, 5 meter, 1.5 okay. meter primary diameter. Mm -hmm. And that is owned by Hiroshima University, relatively small group. So it is relatively small a telescope, but the uh, very good thing is the, uh, it's equipped with the uh, so-called ONIL, that is the uh, optical near infrared polarimeter. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that has a uh, relatively wide field of view, 10 arc minute square. Oh, okay. So it, is, it is very good to kind of this kind of a uh, survey exactly. type Perfect. observation for the parametric uh, observation. Okay. <laughs> and also another good thing is uh, because it is uh, run by uh, Hiroshima University, it's a relatively small groups, and they, they are very much much flexible to uh, uh, allocate the machine time. So we don't need actually to write the official uh, proposal, but rather we yes, just yes, yes, send yes. them an email and yes, they, yes. Uh, discuss with them. <laughs> very convenient, very convenient. Yeah, yeah. So we see such kind of very much friendly okay. discussion we can allocate the machine time. Okay. So that's a very good thing. Okay, yeah, I, I love that. I love, I love that way of doing it. Absolutely. So, Much easier. Yeah. And I guess here we have an example. Yes. So here is the you know, figure one. We can uh, present the, the result of our submission. Yep. So, okay. So this is shown in the galaxy coordinates. So, yes. and the uh, galaxy plane is running uh, horizontally. And the white line segments are the parametric observation we have done. Cool. Yeah, mm -hmm. so they are showing the basically the orientation of the magnetic field at the very position of those stars. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And the, as you can see, they show the, uh, the magnetic field structure might be quite complicated or yes. totally a mess. <laughs> That's a technical yeah. term, yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the uh, the uh, actually for reference the the orange line segment yes. the uh -huh. uh, yellowish one yeah uh, showing the the or, uh, also also the magnetic field orientation uh, observed by Planck satellite ah okay okay so that's the the summary emission of the dust particles so essentially they are covering the the full length of the line so average magnetic field orientation. Right, right. And also the difference is that the Planck satellite observation has a, a somewhat coarse spatial resolution. Yes, yes, the only and, four. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we only hold uh, four independent uh, uh, vectors in this field. Okay. Actually two, only two in the, our observation field of view. Right? Mm -hmm. Only two. <laughs> oh, oh, within this picture, gotcha. Okay, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So, with you. So, our field of view covers the actually 10 arc minute by 17 arc minutes. So we had, mm -hmm. uh, so rectangular uh, field of view that is somewhat inclined in this figure. Okay. Yeah. And we have actually 184 stars identified with the, our parametric observation. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and also cross match with them, uh, uh, with the Gaia distances. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we, we know all the distances of the stars. Nice. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Gotta have. Okay. Yeah. So right. We can identify the parametric uh, uh, position angles, orientation of the magnetic field, and also we know the Gaia distances mm -hmm. of the stars. Then we can compare that the, those uh, angular uh, orientation of the magnetic field with that distance. Yes. So, and then that is, I believe, figure three. <laughs> figure three. I skipped yeah. figure two. Sorry. I know. Not very good. Going back. Oh, going no, back. No. Going back. Figure but three. Page four, I guess. Figure four. Okay. We'll go to figure four. Figure yeah, three. Figure yeah, three. Figure three. We'll get there. Don't worry. We'll get there. Figure three. There we go. Figure three. Angular dependence. Yeah, so yeah, actually figure two shows the, the histogram of the orientation of magnetic field we observe. 
Uh-huh. Then, uh-huh. Yeah, the 90 degrees yes. in the galactic coordinate is uh, orientation of the plane. Mm-hmm. So the histogram shows that the, uh, the distribution is uh, quite wide uh, angular scatters. And also, uh, almost none of the <laughs> magnitude orientation show is parallel to the jack plane. Right. Yeah, mm-hmm. that is quite different from our, our prediction. Indeed. Because, yeah, we, we, yeah, we have believed that the, uh, the global magnitude is running uh, basically along that jack plane, but it's not true for this particular observation. Yeah, that's interesting. OK. Yeah. And what are these two arrows? These two arrows are the plank oh, of self okay. field orientation. Okay. So, yeah, they also show, have, uh, show some offset from the Gatic plane from some, uh, orientation, but the, okay. the yeah, still parameter shows a much wider or much significant scatter offset from the Gatic plane. Yes, yes, on the asymmetry. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, and the important point is that it's a distance dependence. That's, mm-hmm. that, yeah, that's totally new based on our observation, and that is figure three, next to that. Figure three, let's get a global and we'll zoom in as need be. Distance yeah. dependence, okay. Yeah. So horizontal axis is the distance measured by the Gaia satellite. Okay. And then we plot three quantities, and, and the top two panels shows the uh, optical polarization results. Okay. The position angle of the, that, that's the orientation of the field. Uh-huh, and yes. Relative to the character plan of the direction. And then the, the second one is a polarization fraction, right. the degree of the polarization. Yes. But these two are, are uh, the result of our observation. Right? Lovely. That is beautiful. Uh, and the, the bottom one is a uh, G band interstellar extinction that is coming from the Gaia observation. Okay. Okay. For individual stars. The all three, yeah, all three has a, a clear a dependence against, against, against the, the distance, the distance. And what we have done here is the, uh, as indicated by the uh, vertical dashed lines. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We statistically estimate the uh, change point ah. of the uh, distribution. For example, maybe let's see a precision fraction. P, it is uh, going up as the distance goes farther, but yeah. at some point they jumping up. Yes. Uh huh. I, okay. Got it. Uh huh. I see. Yeah. I see. Uh, it. So there must be the position where a uh, interstellar, uh, interstellar dust clouds, mm-hmm. and we, the, our sight line okay. hit that dust cloud. Use that and they hit one. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we uh, statistically estimate the position okay. of these these uh, discontinuities. Yes. The distribution and uh, we detect the okay. uh, four significant positions. So, so as a result, we detected four interstellar clouds along the line of sight. We did det- detected by the uh, optical parametry. Lucky you. Okay. Yes, I see it. Yeah. And in addition to that, the, uh, there is a significant polarization also uh, before the first cloud. Yeah. Closer to us. Uh-huh. Uh, that's, that, there, so there must be a further cloud mm-hmm. near the return to close. But we don't know that the distance to the foreground to cloud, that must be closer to the closest star we observed. Uh, yeah, because it forms sort of a black gown all the way across. OK. Yeah, so mm-hmm. there is a foreground mm-hmm. component. And the foreground component still, mm-hmm. most probably, that is a, the, a shell of the local bubble. So you have that? Yeah, we mentioned measuring the uh, local of magnetic component, but we don't know actually. So it is just a foreground. Okay, okay. Might be. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So anyway, oh. uh, we have a uh, directed five, including foreground cloud, five mm-hmm. interstellar clouds mm-hmm. by measuring the optical okay. parameter. Distinction in the G band. Good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we also apply the very same technique for the interstellar extinction. Okay. Band extinction. Yes. And uh, the, dust, uh, the vertical dashed lines are indicating uh-huh. the, the uh, breaks. Yeah, breaks mm-hmm. the, directing the, the uh, G band extinction. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. as you can see, they are mostly consistent with uh, the breakpoints we uh, directed in the polarization. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Especially the first three are uh, quite consistent yes. to each other. So we are very much confident on them. Get a little wider on this one. 
Yeah, so the last two breaks yeah. are not detected in the polarization. Instead, we have only detected one in polarization. Okay. Uh huh. Around 2000 parsec. It's bound. Okay. So, yeah, so there is a uh, inconsistency, but the, uh, in this paper, we are very much interested in the structure transition of the magnetic field as a function of the distance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so from, from this point, we took, we take a, uh, these four intercircles in addition to, and, and also the foreground ground So in total, five clouds directed okay. by the uh, optical parametry and estimate the um, field structure associated with those individual clouds. Okay. Right, and what's next? I'm with you. Very cool. That's a very nice plot. I like that one. So the table one is just that they are showing those uh, Here's uh, our break distance. Points. Yes. yes. So, actually, so this is called analysis. Yes. And they are actually figure four. Figure four is our cumulative sum. Yeah. So in the figure C, I've shown the, the distance dependence and the detected breakpoints. Yes. But, <laughs> But probably, well, it is statistically significant breakpoints. So yeah, but it's not very clear to us. Okay. But like, but <laughs> yeah, if we yeah, if we check the figure four, you might believe <laughs> that there is the they are significant uh, change mm -hmm. in the orientation of the vectors. So what we plot here is the uh, Q and U stocks Q and U values okay. of the polarization. So we are distance is colored. Okay. Yeah. But Got so it. Uh, so nominal nominal Q and U a uh, plot shows that the Q and U data or Q Q U vectors. Yes. But what yeah. we plot here is the cumulative sum of those vectors. Yes, along my side. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. So so in this diagram, what we want to check is that yeah, if the Q vectors are aligned to each other in a uh, unique direction. Uh huh. So, so that they have the same same amount of the Q and U values. Okay, got it, got so, it. So, yeah. So first, we sort the Q and U data as a, a, a as a distance, sorted by distance, mm -hmm. and they plot the mm -hmm. uh, cumulative sum of the vectors starting from the origin of the uh, Q diagram. Zero. Yes. Yeah. So, and so the first layer, the very uh, closest part, so the vectors goes down. From yes. the origin, yes, as a straight line. Mm -hmm. So it, this indicates the uh, the uh, so uh, Q is basically zero for those vectors. Okay. And, okay. Yeah. Yeah, because it's all you. It's all down. you. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. I'm with you. Mm -hmm. Yes. So yeah, basically the Q and Q vector diagram shows the uh, uh the, so the phase angle of the Q vectors is consist uh, is showing that the the uh, Position angle mm -hmm. of the magnetic field and actually double the uh, position angle. So the position angle is uh, quite consistent to each other for these distance ranges up to 1.23 kiloparsec. Yes. Uh -huh. So yeah. here's one, that's the very first position. They change the orientation, or actually, they, yes. they, after that, they show the only the no zero precession fraction. Yes. So the Q vector, the Q vector length becomes almost zero. Yes, very tiny. Yeah. So so there is a significant change in the polarization fraction. So mm -hmm. that gives a a, a quite significant mm -hmm. confident detection of the intercircle at one point two two three. Right. 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 Okay. That makes perfect sense. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the it, this 1.23 kiloparsec is actually the position of the. We we our satellite line is entering into the uh, Sagittarius spiral. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And after one one point four seven kilopas, then the vector starting up, up again. Yes, it uh, or one point four seven. Yep, it starts taking off again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In. And yep. up to one point six three kilopas. And we turn around and we yeah come so back. There is a, yeah, yeah. 80 degree panel. Yeah. So, as I said, the, uh, this phase angle in the Q diagram is the, double the position angle of that uh, polarization orientation. Definitely. So, 180 uh, reversal means the uh, magnetic field position angle uh, shows a 90 degree rotation. 
Okay. This particular okay. lump of okay. sensory droplets. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Then, in up to 2.23 kilopascal, they are showing consistent Sweet. orientation. And at 2.23 kilopascal, they totally change yes. the other direction. Correct. So, as such, we direct, uh, detected four wow. distinct interstellar plots. Mm-hmm. And okay. also the foreground. Yes. So, in total, five. <laughs> yes. Like your class. Uh, ah, very nice. Okay. Very nice. And the figure five is showing the uh, actual location of those detected clouds. Uh huh. So this is the uh, this this color scale shows the the surface density of the interstellar material that is estimated based on the Gaia interstellar extinction data. Yes, AG. Uh huh. Oh, here we go. Here's a little so, more. Yeah. At the very center, we, we are located. The sun is at the very center of this diagram. Mm-hmm. 180, L0. Yeah, so the excess axis is pointing the, toward the yep. center. OK. Oh, so, of course, uh, longitude is zero. OK, I'm with you, 1.23. Yeah. 1. Yes, so as you can see, the red dashed lines are the side oh. line. Along the side line. Yes, yes, I got it. Yay. Yeah. Yeah, so 1.2 kilo, to 3 kilopascal up to two, uh, 2 kiloparsec. Uh-huh. Detected multiple, multiple interstellar And nice. there, yeah, there is a, a foreground component probably associated with this a, a dense aquila reef. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cloud. But the, uh, our sight line is designed as the, we are looking beneath the aquila reef because the aquila reef itself has a, too much extinction. Sure. So we can look, yes. yeah, we can look through the backside of this aqua lift cloud. So we we, we chose we chose the sight line that is somewhat offset from the correct Good. obscuration. Good, I'm with you. Yes, yeah. yes. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Uh, I like yeah, as a result, we can well successfully detect these uh, clouds within the uh, in the slide. Yeah. Okay. Then, yeah. Next we. We can check the, the actual manifold structure of those individual clouds. Okay. Okay. And first, we can do is uh, divide our uh, cell parameter data as a function of their distance, actually distance ranges. Yes. Okay. And that is that is done in the next figure. Yeah, I think so. This is done in figure. Uh, that's yeah. That's figure six and figure seven. Okay. So figure six is the actual. Uh, precision vectors we have detected and divided them into the distance ranges. Yes. And in figure seven, here's the, the histogram of their orientations, position angles. Okay. So Wait, as, we, yeah, the, as we... This one here, this one here, this yes. one here, color-coded. Very good. Okay, I'm with you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So as I said, we have detected five interstellar clouds along the line of side. And so we can divide the, the sterile data into five mm-hmm. distance ranges. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. For example, at the if you point, so yeah, the 1.23 kiloparsec to 1.47 kiloparsec mm-hmm. data, for example, that yeah. is, those are the data which traces the magnitude of the two interstellar cloud at 1.23 kiloparsec. Okay, yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's such we divided them into five uh, oh, uh, distance groups. Yes. And it mm-hmm. is, so it is already showing with quite an yeah, interesting result, I believe. So if we plot them all together, as we, we have done in figure one, the first one, so the, they show a very messy. Yes. Right, right. It, it looks like it's all over the place. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, if, if we just divide yeah, them. Boom, 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 boom. This is this is the tomography part. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so we should, if we just divide them uh, as a function of distance. Five tomography shots. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Then, then here, here are the results. They are showing the very much smooth uh, distribution of the field at mm-hmm. each distance ranges. Mm-hmm. Very good. Yeah. So the, the first first main message is that the uh, uh, if we refer to the Planck observation that has the uh, coarse spatial resolution, yes, and compare that with, uh, for example, polarization, stellar polarization data, 
that has okay. higher spatial resolution, yes. then the spatial distribution might be quite different. Our stellarization shows they are quite messy, yeah, random magnitude. Yes. If we don't divide them into distance. But but in reality, the, uh, what we are seeing is that they are the very much smooth on the field structure at okay. each distance. Okay. So the difference between the stellar parametry and the plan observation is the, not because they have a different a, a spatial resolution, but they are covering different range of the distance. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah. So okay. that is first main, very much main that's, point, I think. That's important, okay. Okay, then, then we are going into some yeah, complicated part because we just divide them into distance Yes. And, but still, they are raw data. And as I, as I said, the, uh, the, the parameterization, parameter data are cumulative. So for, so for instance, the further most part, mm -hmm. the distance is greater than 2.23 geoparsic data. It itself traces the, the all five class along okay. the line class. This is, so this is the, uh, the uh, integrated data. Yes. For average value of the QNU. Of all the five class on the right side. Okay. So we need so we need to differentiate them. Yes. To, to estimate the actual structure of the molecule. Okay. Or uh, associated with the individual molecule class. And for that purpose, what we do is that in the next figure. Okay. So let's go. There's our mean average thinking angles and figure. Ooh, ooh that's a nice one. Figure eight. Uh, figure eight. So, so here we we need to go back to the Q and U diagram. Uh huh. And what we plot here is the observed value of the Q and U values of the optical parametry and color them by the distance groups. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Again, color coded. Q gal versus U gal. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Look. if so, so if we uh, if we want to well, deduce the, uh, the uh, uh, magnetic field structure associated with the, uh, the nth, nth crowd, mm -hmm. the nth crowd traces the polarization uh, information of it, uh, from first, second, third, up to n crowds. Okay, yes. All together, all together. And if we, so if we observe the n minus one distance range, then that trace a uh, first, second, third, up to n minus one intercircle along the line side, along the line of side, right? I'm with so you. if we want to estimate the nth class intrinsic uh, Q and U values, yes, we just we can just subtract the n minus one Q and U values. Uh, okay, okay. From the nth class Q and U. Uh -huh. values. Mm -hmm. And for that purpose, we just subtract a the a average Q and U value of the n minus one class uh -huh. from okay. the nth class data. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that is typically yeah, the, uh, these black thick lines. Ah, uh, gotcha. Right here. Pink, pink. Yeah. With these two angles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, so uh, okay. yeah, for example, for the furthest class, that is yellow one. Yellow one. Yellow one, the Q and U, the U data, uh, the observed value of the Q and U data uh, shows the, the Q and U vectors starting from the origin of this diagram. Yes. But instead, if we uh, want to estimate the, the intrinsic Q and, Q and U values okay. of the, this yellow cloud, yes. then we just uh, subtract in the uh, light, light green. <laughs> yes, yes. Light green, that is a, uh, you just in front of those points, in point six, three, right in front, yeah. right? Oh, okay, I'm waiting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. This uh, light green cloud itself has a special variation. So we yeah. don't know exactly what is the Q and values of the the foreground component of the US stars. So we don't know exactly, but it's, uh, instead we just remove, we just subtract the average value. Correct. Of the correct. Yes. Yeah, so they will be scattered around that. Yeah. Uh, so uh -huh. that's corresponding to the the shift, uh, the origin of this uh, equation diagram, to the average position of the 
for example, light green data. Mm -hmm. Yes. As shown by the uh, black thick lines. Mm -hmm. Pink, pink. I got it. Okay, good. Yeah. Good. Uh -huh. so by subtracting the uh, foreground uh, average values, then we can uh, uh, deduce the intrinsic magnet field orientation. Yes. And that is shown in figure, next figure. Mm. Okay. That's figure nine and 10. Yes. So this is our background subtracted. Yeah, background subtracted. Oops. So this is the orientation itself is the, uh, the intrinsic magnet field orientation associated with each individual cloud. Cool, I'm with you. So, yeah, yeah. Right. Comparing to the previous pictures, see, so it is showing even smoother. Correct. Structure. Yeah, there's more structure to it. Yeah. <laughs> and also, still, they are very much offset from the active plane orientation. Yes. Okay. Wow. Huh. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's the main message, but still, yeah. Yeah, another, well, <laughs> yeah, one more thing, one more thing we need to do is that uh, we just uh, subtract the average, uh, average foreground contribution. So you get a difference, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we still uh, don't subtract the spatial variation. Yeah, no, so, mm -hmm. yeah, if we go back to the previous picture, picture, uh, figure eight. Yes, uh-huh. Yeah, as you can see, the circles are indicating the uh, yeah, size of the spatial distribution of Q and U values. Yeah, yeah. That's corresponding to the, the angular variation of the magnetic field orientation. Yeah. And as you can see, yeah, yeah, in the figure eight again. Can you go about say about Yeah, yeah. sorry, we just got a little bandwidth lag. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the size of the distribution indicated by the circles becoming larger as the distance goes farther. Um yes. I see it. Uh-huh. Yes. So the static scatter is also integrated. Okay. Because the Q and U values uh, have a random walk if we if the, uh, if we trace the multiple multiple clouds along the line of If you got multiple, yes. Uh -huh. yeah. So the the statistical scatter must also be subtracted from the foreground cloud okay. as a foreground cloud contribution. Okay. To estimate the actual angular scatter of the uh, magnetic field of each mm -hmm. individual interstellar clouds. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that can also and that can only done uh, statistically. Subtraction. Mm -hmm. So the, the one point is that in this, yeah, in that figure nine, we show the uh, foreground subtracted magnetic field structure, but it is the only uh, uh, subtracted for the average value. Yes. So the angular orientation, the uh, average orientation is correct, but it's, they still have a uh, statistical scatter or angular variation. variation. Okay. Integrated. So the angular variation is the true angular variation must be much smaller compared to these figures. Mm, true. Okay. Okay. And yeah, that can be uh, estimated numerically. So that will be uh, estimated in the discussion section. Okay. Okay. So let us go into the discussion. Okay, let's head down to the discussion. Discussion. Yeah, and this is quite, quite a yeah, complicated part of the paper. Okay. And uh, let me start with the, uh, yeah, figure 11, that is a uh, creation between the position fraction, P in the horizontal axis, and the position angles uh, variation, sigma PA in the vertical axis. Yes, and I think that was defined up here, I think. Or down here. Yeah, okay. I'm good. Okay. And the color symbols are our observation. Thanks, yes. It's consistent. And, Thank you. Yeah, and they are roughly showing a negative correlation to each other. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. And actually, this kind of anti correlation has been observed by the Planck satellite. Okay. And in the Planck case, they, they have a perfect anti correlation, and the slope is minus one. Okay. And yeah, this time we observed the, uh, such kind of uh, rough anti correlation, but the slope is uh, somewhat shallower. Than yes. Minus one. Yes. Yes. And yeah, this anti creation have been understood by the Planck people uh, as the, the result of the multiple magnitude structure sure. proposed along the lamp side. Sure, the anti correlation, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and they explain this anti creation by a, a, a numerical twin model. Okay. And if we uh, a, uh, observe the multiple magnetic field structure, a superpose along the line of sight, and they, they also the average. Then you make a they can show this kind of anti correlation. Yes. But the, uh, okay. the mm -hmm. uh, slope is different in this case. Yes. So, what we're trying to understand is that the, if these kind of anti correlation with different slopes is coming from the same, uh, same physics, the okay. proposition of the multiple. Okay. Uh, molecular structures. And the, uh, what we written in uh, equation two mm -hmm. <laughs> is uh, actually the uh, uh, physics uh, behind. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, that is actually a geometric, uh, very easily understood. Yeah. Uh, okay. We, uh, so we can go back again to figure eight. Yes. The QNU diagram. Yes. Ah, data. So as I, as I said, the, uh, the superposition of the multiple magnitude structure is the, uh, uh, in this diagram, that is the, 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 the offset of the origin of the diagram. Uh-huh, yes, uh-huh. To the different position. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. And let me, let me oh, see that. Can I, can I annotate the figure? Uh, not immediately. <laughs> Is it is it coming? Uh, let me try. Oh yeah, I see it. Yeah, yeah. Come okay, on. okay. So in the QNU diagram, the, uh, the well distance from the origin to the data point. Yes. Yeah. So that is the length of the Q vector, corresponds to the uh, polarization fraction. P. Yes. Uh huh. And uh, uh, the phase angle corresponds to the double the position angle. So the Viewing angle of uh -huh. the data distribution corresponds to the uh, angular variation. Correct. As you go across, yes. Yeah. Okay, and that's your that's your theta. Yeah, and then so if we so estimate an intrinsic magnetic structure, we shift the origin from this point to this point. Yeah. Then the p becomes different. P becomes larger. Yes. And, yes. And on the other hand, angular variation becomes must be smaller. Uh huh. Okay. So the data the, the, the distribution becomes farther yes. from the origin. Uh huh. So they so naturally they uh, uh, create an inverse link to each other. So that's the simple reason why we observe the uh, the anti-correlation between the presidential fraction and angular dispersion. Got it. Cool. Thank you. Very nice. And, and the equation two shows the exact yeah. estimation of the uh, statistical but that was probability a... distribution. Nice physical explanation of equation two. There's our yeah. position angles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And actually, we can normalize the uh, presidential fraction P uh, with the size of the uh, distribution of the chain values. Right here. Yeah. Yeah. And if you normalize that in, that is shown in figure 12. Okay. All right. Yes, exactly. Okay. The thick line shows the, the distribution of the equation two. Mm -hmm. So when the P is large compared to the distribution of sigma Q and U, Q and you've normalized. Okay. Mm -hmm. They are correlated perfectly with the slope of minus one. Yeah, here's Plonk, right? This is Plonk on the dash. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh -huh. but, but the smaller part, they uh, deviate from the linear uh -huh. collaboration and becoming the shallower. Uh, mm -hmm. so, gets most of it once you start getting smaller. There's some deviation, yes, right here. Uh -huh. and, yeah, if you plot the, uh, the optical polarization, we observe. Uh -huh. Oh, there's our five distance groups, yes. Uh -huh. yeah. Yes. And they are perfect match with the, uh, the theoretical half we estimated. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Uh, yeah, so our conclusion is that the, uh, so uh, truly we observe the multiple layers of the multi field structures. Yes. As, as, done, yeah, as was done by Planck Satellite. And we are all, all observing the same trend. Cool. The anti correlation. Yay. Very good. Okay. So now we can go to the second part of the discussion. Okay. The actual equation three. Did I miss it? Oh, let's get there. Do, 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 five. Equation three, here we go. Sigma. Yeah. So as I said, the, uh, the projection angle dispersion sigma PA in equation three. Mm -hmm. Uh, multiplied with the parisage fraction. That's why you need it's it. nearly constant. Yeah, it's nearly constant. That means the parisage angle dispersion and the parisage fraction are anti-correlated to each other. Mm -hmm. So the parisage angle dispersion itself it shows the the uh, magnetic field turbulent part of the uh, magnetic field structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the parisage fraction. And also we write here the uh, AG, G band extinction that corresponds to the column density of the uh, interstellar clouds. Oh, yes, uh-huh, I'm with you, yes. Okay, yeah. H, we got so, the and we amplitude. Okay, good. <clears throat> it also indicates the polarization angle dispersion, magnetic field amplitude, and the polarization fraction divided by the interstellar extinction that is the uh, polarization efficiency of mm -hmm. the interstellar cloud. And also the column density of the interstellar cloud. Yes. These are the important figure uh, three uh, physical quantities. Yes. yes. We can deduce from the observation. Okay. Uh, but the precision angle dispersion itself needs to be a uh, uh, corrected, and we can we must estimate the intrinsic precision angle dispersion at okay. each uh, uh, interstellar cloud. Uh, but we cannot simply uh, subtract the polarization angle dispersion as a function distance because it is a, a nonlinear correlation to each other, okay. Okay. as mm -hmm. we have shown in the previous figure, it's a vertical curve. Yes. So instead, what we can do is that there's uh, sigma q and u, that is the, the q and u values distribution on the qu diagram. Yes. So okay. yeah. Yeah. That we can observe. Sigma Q and U. Uh -huh. And also the uh, P, fractional polarization, that is also we can observe nice. and we can differentiate. Go to town. To es estimate the individual interstellar clouds, the intrinsic values. Nice. Mm -hmm. And also interstellar cloud extinction, that is also can be uh, differentiated to okay. estimate the individual interstellar clouds, uh, cloud density. Okay. So those are those can be estimated from the observation. Yes. And from those values, we, uh, we refer to the theoretical curve equation two. Yes. Then we can estimate the, the sigma PA, positional okay. angle dispersion, intrinsic positional angle dispersion. Yes. With interest of mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm with you. I'm following. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then that is a uh, tabulated. In table five. Table five, did I go by that? Table five, yes, here we go, the amplitudes. Yeah, the rightmost part here, the angular dispersion or the turbulent component of magnetic field. Okay. It brings it to uh, each interstellar class. Yes. Give me Q. Okay. All of them. All of them. I guess it's a sum. Do, do. Do, 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 do. Very cool. Error bars. Yeah, those are the intrinsic values. Yes. Nice. We estimate it. And then we go four, three, seven, four, one. We bounce up and then we go down. Okay. Uh huh. Right. So these are the, the level of tolerance of the magnetic field. 
associated with each well individual interest clause. B, the total common small. Okay, gotcha. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then if we compare those values with the column density of individual interest clause. Okay. That's figure 13. Okay, let's get to figure 13. I'm with you. I'm hanging in here, figure 13. Yes, here's our sigma PA. Okay, and our five distance groups. <laughs> yeah, and their column densities. The column Fine. densities are Sorry. Um, 10 to the 21st. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Square centimeters, particle per square centimeters. And the, the vertical mm -hmm. axis shows the, uh, the angular variation or the level of turbulence of the magnetic field structure. Mm -hmm. That's the uh, indication of the strength of the magnetic field. Relative to turbulence. Yeah, so if they are turbulent, the magnetic field structure, they must have a, a weaker magnetic field strength. Yes. Huh. And if we, they have a more uniform, a less turbulent magnetic field structure, that must be the indication of the strength, uh, stronger magnetic field. Yes. Uh huh. And the, with okay. this diagram, it is, it is not uh, there. Obviously, there are not enough data points, but still, they are <laughs> having some <laughs> rough trend that the larger the column density, correct, of individual interest class, they tend to have a more aligned magnetic field. Yes. Yes. Or yeah, more a stronger magnetic field strength. Question. Yes. Mm hmm. Yeah. And so if we okay. make an estimate, uh, the magnetic field strength, the very much rough estimation sure. based on this angular dispersion, uh, yeah. based on the uh, so-called uh, uh, chandra cycle film method, uh, that is, is shown in equation four, right-hand side equation. Mm -hmm. Good. And that shows the, uh, the magnetic field strength of around 10 to 20 microvolts that is shown below. Four and okay, gotcha. And one, two, three, four, five. Yes, these are micro gauss. 12, 13, 12, 21. Yep, they get larger as you go. Okay, cool. Very nice. Very nice. So the interesting point is that they are, they are going back to uh, figure 13. Okay. The okay. Columbus range we trace. Is uh, around 10 to the 21st. Yes. Going up, please. Where's 13? I lost 13. Oh, here it is. 13. Yeah, yeah, 13. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right next to it. Uh, uh, yes. 13. Mm -hmm. Yep, right here. So the column this range you observed is that uh, it is known that the, uh, based on the, for example, SEMA splitting observation of mm -hmm. the bank field strength, the interstellar class of this column density range is the, uh, just the uh, critical level that we uh, turn from the uh, magnetically subcritical condition ah. to magnetically supercritical condition. Okay. Okay. And uh, above this uh, column density level, they tend to be magnetically supercritical, okay. that means gravitationally unstable. So gravitation co contracting. Mm -hmm. Star formation. Yeah, with dragging the uh, magnetic field structure, magnetic field, field lines. Cool. So that the magnetic field strength is becoming uh, more intense. Yes, yes. It becomes larger. I'd expect. Mm -hmm. And our observation shows the very same trend. Oh, cool. so, right. Yeah, so the, this, this column, this level, you see uh, the very, so it's tracing the very initial phase of the cell formation. Boom. So in that sense, it is very much interesting to trace this column, this range, and estimate magnetic field structure associated with these individual interest clause. Nice. So our conclusion is that this technique, it is very much first time applied is kind of a multiple interstellar uh, magnetic field structure tomography. Uh -huh. It's quite a, uh, must be quite powerful to, to uh, trace the magnetic field structure associated with this very much initial phase of the formation process. Yes. So that's, that's the conclusion of our story. Very nice. Very nice. Yasuo, thank you so much for walking us through your very lovely article. Very nice. Thanks.
And you touched on it a little bit there uh, toward the end. So so let me push on it a little bit. Um, so, so where do you think we go from here, given the published article? Are there plans to get more tomography slices? Can you do this along other spiral arms? Um, just sort of next steps, where, where do we go from here? Yeah, next step is, uh, for this project, it is quite obvious. So, uh, as we show, uh, we cover only a tiny patch of the sky. Right. Um, that is around 10 per six scale. Mm -hmm. And we observe the magnetic field at this spatial scale is quite smooth mm -hmm. at each distance. And in distance, they have distinctly inclined from the dark line. Yes. So yeah. obviously, we need to go further, uh, wider observ observation field, and to uh, observe what exactly the larger scale magnetic field structure, and if they have any, any tangible uh, contribution for taping the larger scale of the market uh, clouds is mm -hmm. into uh, spiral arms. So we need to go uh, additional uh, uh, observation. So we are now working on that. Good, good. Wider observation field. To reveal the wider structure of the magnetic field. Mm -hmm. was, that, was that just an email to get, to get the time? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Yes. And also, one very much final thing is that we are very much happy to collaborate with others. So, yeah, if anybody happened to watch this video and be kindly be interested in this kind of project, please do contact us. Okay, and there you we go. We are very much happy. Yeah. Very good. Nice. Okay. Yasuo, yeah, so yes. thank you so much. Yeah. And thank that, you very much. Thank you. And that will do everyone. And I hope this made your. Magnetic Astronomy Day just a little bit better, and we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye.